In this chapter, we are going to discuss the basics of statistical hypothesis testing. In particular, we will introduce the hypothesis testing for a population mean and for a population proportion. In the end, we will talk about how to compute the probability of type 2 error beta and the power of hypothesis test. OK, let's get started. First, let's understand the starting point of any hypothesis test, null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. Null hypothesis is typically denoted by H0. This is a tentative assumption about a population parameter. In this chapter, the population parameter in question is the population mean or population proportion. For example, the average household size in Bay Area is 2.7. Alternative hypothesis, often denoted by H subscript A or H1, is just the opposite of the null hypothesis. Following our example, the corresponding alternative hypothesis is the average household size in Bay Area is not 2.7 or different from 2.7. In practice, identifying the null and the alternative hypothesis can be confusing. Here are some rules that can help us correctly identify our hypothesis. Null hypothesis is an assumption you want to challenge. A convenient way is to think of null hypothesis as established assumption or the default assumption. Alternative hypothesis, more often than not, is a statement you want to establish to replace the established or default assumption. For example, Toyota claims that, according to EPA, Prius has a gas mileage of 50 miles per gallon in a city. Let's say you are suspicious and want to prove Toyota wrong. In this case, your null hypothesis will be that Prius MPG is greater than or equal to 50 miles per gallon in a city. You may wonder why it says greater than or equal to 50 miles per gallon instead of equal to 50 miles per gallon. Well, the matter of the fact is, customers do not mind at all if the actual gas mileage is better than the claimed 50. The alternative hypothesis is then, Prius gas mileage is less than 50. Sometimes, the alternative hypothesis is also called research hypothesis. Probably because of this, companies nowadays are very careful with the wording of their claims. According to the Google, Toyota claims that 2017 Prius has up to 58 miles per gallon in the city. We actually see this very often. For example, when we go shopping, stores put up signs saying 50% off or 75% off in huge font size all the time. Usually, they put up to in much smaller font size. This trick makes it impossible to prove them wrong, but it makes up to one of my least favorite English words. Conventionally, population mean is denoted by mu, and the hypothesized population mean is denoted by mu zero. The two examples mentioned earlier indicate that there are different forms of hypothesis. Indeed, there are three forms. The first kind is the hypothesis of lower tail test. Algebraically, H0 is mu greater than or equal to mu0, and HA is mu less than mu0. Our Toyota Prius example is a case of lower tail test. In this example, the hypothesized population mean is 50. For students who are new to hypothesis testing, I always recommend to write down the hypothesis in algebraic format as well as in English. In the Toyota Prius example, H0 is mu greater than or equal to 50, meaning that Toyota claims a gas mileage of 50 mpg or better. HA is mu less than 50, meaning that we want to challenge Toyota's claim and establish that the actual mpg is less than 50. 
The second form is upper tail test. H0 is giving us mu less than or equal to mu0, and HA is mu greater than mu0. A convenient way to memorize upper and lower tail test is to look at the alternative hypotheses. On the axis of real number, if the alternative hypothesis is mu greater than mu0, then the focus is on the right-hand side of mu0, which is the upper tail on the real axis. If alternative hypothesis is mu less than mu0, then the focus is on the left-hand side of mu0, which is the lower tail on the real axis. The third and last form is two-tailed test. The null hypothesis H0 is mu equals mu0, and the alternative hypothesis HA is mu is not equal to mu0. Actually, our very first example of average household size in Bay Area fits this form of two-tailed test. The hypothesis testing we've talked about is technically statistical hypothesis testing, and we draw conclusions based on random samples. But there's no guarantee a randomly chosen sample will be representative of the entire population. The smaller the sample size is, the more likely we see an extreme sample or a sample that is not representative of the population. For example, we want to test whether a coin is a fair coin. The null hypothesis is that this is a fair coin. We decide to flip this coin three times. Suppose we follow this decision rule. If we see three heads or three tails, we conclude this is not a fair coin. Otherwise, we say this is a fair coin. Let's say we indeed get three tails in a row. According to our decision rule, we conclude this is not a fair coin. The question is, is this conclusion reasonable? Think about it. Even if this is a fair coin, there is 25% chance to get three tails or three heads in a row. If this is indeed a fair coin, and we conclude that this is not a fair coin because we see three tails or three heads, then we made a mistake. This mistake is called type 1 error. In general, type 1 error means that we incorrectly reject the null hypothesis when it is indeed correct. In our example, there is 25% chance for us to make type 1 error. Actually, this probability of 25% is called p-value, which we will talk much more about on the next slide. Conventionally, we use alpha to denote the acceptable probability of making type 1 error. Alpha should be familiar to us. We saw alpha in interval estimation already, as we knew, Alpha is also called significance level. Similarly, it is also possible for us to make the other type of error, which we call type 2 error. Type 2 error means that we incorrectly accept H0 when H0 is indeed false. The probability of making type 2 error is denoted by beta, and 1 minus beta is often called the power of the hypothesis test. It is more difficult to compute the beta, which we will discuss in a bit more detail at the end of this chapter. Now, I want to bring you back to our coin flip example and its decision rule. In machine learning, decision rule is also called decision boundary. You probably realized the importance of decision rule. Different decision rules will lead to different conclusions and different probabilities of type 1 and type 2 errors. In our example, let's consider an extreme decision rule. If we see at least two heads or at least two tails, we conclude this is not a fair coin. Otherwise, this is a fair coin. Think about it. What would be our conclusion? It shouldn't surprise you that, based on the new decision rule, we will always claim this is a biased coin. We toss the coin three times, of course, there will be at least two heads or at least two tails. So the probability of type 1 error is equal to 1. What would be the probability we make type 2 error? It is 0, because 
we will never mistakenly call a biased coin a fair one. Hopefully, through our rather extreme example, you get some intuitive idea that there is trade out between type 1 error and type 2 error. Indeed, if you want to lower the probability of type 1 error, it comes at a cost of higher probability of type 2 error. What if we want to reduce alpha and beta simultaneously? Well, there's also a way to do that. Not surprisingly, increase your sample size. By the completion of this chapter, at least, you should be able to show the trade-out between alpha and beta as well as the effect of sample size on alpha and beta computationally. Now, let's look at different scenarios of hypothesis testing. We start with one-tailed hypothesis test of population mean when population standard deviation sigma is turn. The test statistic we use here is our old friend z-score. It is given by sample mean minus the hypothesized population mean, then divided by the standard error. Based on this statistic, we can compute the p-value, one of the most important statistical concepts. Let's see what p-value means. P-value is the probability of observing a result as extreme as or more extreme than the sampling result, assuming that H0 is true. Here is a lazy interpretation of p-value. P-value is the probability that H0 is true, given the finding from our sample. Recall that alpha is our level of significance. In hypothesis testing, alpha is actually the maximum acceptable probability of making type 1 error. P-value, on the other hand, is the actual probability of making type 1 error. All in all, the smaller p-value is, the more evidence we have to reject H0, and the significance level alpha is the cutoff value. If p-value is less than or equal to alpha, we reject H0. This is sometimes called the rejection rule. Here's how we compute p-value in the one-tailed hypothesis test for population mean. Suppose the cumulative distribution function or CDF of our test statistic z-score is capital F. Thanks to the central limit theorem, we know it is approximately normal. So in an upper tail test, p-value is 1 minus f of z, and in a lower tail test, the p-value is simply f of z. We reject null hypothesis if p-value is less than or equal to alpha. There's another way to determine whether we should reject the null hypothesis. It is called critical value approach. Suppose capital F superscript negative 1 is the inverse CDF. If you recall, in Python's SciPy library, inverse CDFs are typically written as PPF, or point percentage function. Critical value is associated with alpha, the level of significance. In the lower tail test, the critical value, often denoted as z subscript alpha, is equal to f superscript negative 1 of alpha. If the actual z value is less than or equal to the critical value, we reject the null hypothesis. In upper tail test, the critical value is equal to f superscript negative 1 of 1 minus alpha. Reject the null if the actual z-score is greater than or equal to the critical value. Alternatively, in either one-tailed test, we reject the null hypothesis if the absolute value of actual z-score is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the critical value. Now, let's consider the trickier case of two-tailed test of a population mean. The rejection rules remain the same whether we use p-value approach or critical value approach. The difference is the way we compute the p-value and the critical value. Actually, if we are comfortable with what we have done in interval estimation, it should be easy as well. You may say interval estimation is always two-tailed, because we always cut out both upper and lower tails in a symmetric way. Here, in two-tailed hypothesis test, it is the same. So 
the p-value in a two-tailed test will simply be twice the p-value in its corresponding one-tailed test. While computing the critical values, we replace alpha with alpha over 2, and we're all good. Here is a summary how we conduct hypothesis testing. We begin with the development of now and alternative hypotheses, then specify the alpha value or our significance level. In the next step, we collect sample data and compute test statistic. Then we compute either p-value or critical value. In the end, we can draw our conclusion whether to reject the null hypothesis. On this slide and the next one, we have two examples of hypothesis testing of a population mean when population standard deviation is known. In this first example, I hope you can tell right away it is a lower tail test. Please conduct the test using both p-value and critical value approaches. In this second example, it is a two-tailed test because we are testing whether they are different. Once again, please give this example a try with both approaches. If we understand hypothesis test of a population mean when population standard deviation sigma is known, it is almost the same if we test a population mean when sigma is unknown. Two differences. One, replace sigma with sample standard deviation S. Two, replace normal distribution with corresponding T distribution with degree of freedom M minus one. And N is our sample size as usual. On this slide, you see the details about one tailed test of a population mean when sigma is unknown. And on this next slide, you have the details about two-tailed test of a population mean when sigma is unknown. I'm hoping that you will not have much trouble understanding these two slides. This slide nicely summarizes all three tests of a population mean when population standard deviation sigma is unknown, including hypotheses, test statistic, and both rejection rules. Here are two examples of hypothesis testing for a population mean when sigma is unknown. One on this slide, the other on the next slide. In this example, it is a lower tailed test. And in this second example, it is a two tailed test. Please complete both examples on your own. Hypothesis test about a population proportion is much easier than its counterpart of testing a population mean. Similarly, we have lower tail, upper tail, and two tailed tests. Rejection rules are also the same. Just remember, we have a specific formula for computing standard error when we are dealing with proportions. And we don't have to worry about p distributions here. Instead, as long as sample size is sufficiently large, we can use normal distribution all along. Here are two examples of hypothesis testing for a population proportion. One on this slide, the other on the next slide. In this first example, it is an upper tail test. This second example is slightly trickier. It is a two-tailed test. But suppose this national brand ketchup manufacturer would like to see whether the percentage of supermarket shoppers who believe that the supermarket ketchup was as good as its national brand ketchup is less than 64%. Can you help them test this new hypothesis? Also, I hope you understand that this national brand ketchup manufacturer prefers lower percentage than 64%. Actually, the lower the better for the national brand ketchup manufacturers. Now, it's time to discuss type 2 error. First of all, let's revisit type 1 error and type 2 error. Over the years of teaching this subject, I've sensed that the major reason why many students are confused about type 1 and type 2 errors is that they tend to forget about the premises of these two errors. The starting point is always our null hypothesis. The premise of type 1 error is that the null hypothesis H0 is true, given that there's only one way for us to make a mistake, that is, 
we incorrectly reject H0 when it is indeed true. The probability of rejecting H0 when it is true is nothing but our p-value. In alpha, the level of significance is just the maximum acceptable probability of making type 1 error. The premise of type 2 errors is now hypothesis is false. Given now hypothesis is false, there is also one way for us to make a mistake. That is, we incorrectly accept the now hypothesis when it is indeed false. The probability of making type 2 error is often denoted by beta. Sometimes, people also talk about the power of hypothesis test, which is simply 1 minus beta. In other words, the power is the probability that we correctly reject the null hypothesis when it is indeed false. As mentioned earlier, people tend to forget about the premises of type 1 and type 2 errors, particularly for people new to hypothesis testing. Compounded with the fact that people discuss type 2 error on the basis of alternative hypotheses rather than null hypotheses, as well as the fact that people use different languages such as accept or fail to reject, all in all, it makes the whole thing rather confusing to many people. To me, the best way to get out of this confusion is to create your own framework of hypothesis testing and see how different pieces fit into the framework, and then practice and practice a little bit more. Pretty soon, you will get used to all those details in hypothesis testing. Sometimes, people plot a power curve to visualize how power changes for different values of population mean. Next, we will see how we can find the value of beta or the probability of making type 2 error for a given value of population mean. Once we know beta, the power is just 1 minus beta, and plotting power curve should be straightforward. On this slide, you see a step-by-step -step procedure for computing beta, the probability of making type 2 error. It looks pretty dry. The best way to understand it is to go over examples in great details. Before we jump into any example, I just want to remind you that the value of beta and the value of power as well are determined by the level of significance or our alpha value and the given value of population mean. Here is an example from our textbook. I will probably make a separate video on this example when time allows. Instead, please watch another video of my hypothesis testing example, Coin Fairness. In that video, I've created my own example about how to test whether a coin is fair. Much detail has been provided, including how to compute beta. I'm hoping you can watch that video and then revisit this example on this slide. Hopefully, you know how to handle the questions in this example by watching my coin fairness testing video.